Welcome back, everybody, to Be The Trader. Today, I have a very special guest. Uh, it is someone that I respect. I look up to him and his firm. I've been following him on Twitter for quite some time. It's my first time able to talk to him, so I'm excited to talk to Stan. Stan, welcome. And for everyone who doesn't know, he's from Seven Points Capital. So, Stan, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Alex. It's my pleasure. I really enjoy uh, enjoy your podcast. You got quite a lineup there. You got a lot of great guests, and uh, it's my pleasure to be, you know, um, part of your show. That's excited to have you here. Like I said, so let's just get things started. Can you kind of give me a little background? You know, what got you in this trading world, and then we'll take it off. Uh, so I started. Uh, I think I placed my first trade in 2013, and uh, but I. I really started dabbling into day trading in 2014. I think um, I was in college. I think it was like junior year college or something like that. And um, the reason I started because I couldn't find any internships for the summer. And uh, like all my friends got internships and I was just like, what the hell, man? Like nobody wants to hire me. Like I can't even be like a printer boy. Like what the hell? You know, I can't even bring coffee to the boss or whatever. You know, so I was like pretty discouraged, but honestly, it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I was like, you know, screw everybody. I'm just going to like learn this day trading thing because I already like placed a few trades and I think I made a profit on one of them, but got, got like super lucky. And um, yeah, and I just got bit by the bug. I was just like sitting at home. I didn't have a summer semester. So I was sitting at home and just doing research, reading books and uh, joined, uh, you know, a chat room. I was just kind of chasing uh, you know, alerts and stuff for like first probably four months or so. And then I realized I was like, what the hell these guys are pumping. I, I couldn't believe it took me like four months to realize it, but yeah. Um, but that's how it started. Yeah. 2014. And then 2015 is when I joined seven points. I already had a pretty decent understanding of support resistance trends, risk management and whatnot. And, uh, I applied and then I came in to speak to my cats. I showed some of my charts, some of my trades, executions, and he's like, yeah, this is basically what we do. Uh, and, uh, and the rest is history, man. So how does that work though? Like, so you, so you, you get into my uh, seven, seven points. Right. What happens after there? Were you already finding consistency or did they help you get to consistency? What, what happens next? Yeah. So I wasn't consistently profitable, but I was, I was basically a break-even trader at that point, um, but I was really mostly because I was undercapitalized because I was just like burning my account with commissions. It was like six dollars for just one way, I think, or like four dollars. So it was like I was trading like three hundred share positions, and like in and out, I was down twelve bucks right away, and on three hundred shares, you know. So I was like sort of break-even trader. Uh, but obviously, like, I mean, I was far from a profitable trader. I, I, I kind of sucked, to be honest with you, because when I started yeah. trading at seven points, I had all the locates, I had no commissions, none of that stuff. And I was still unprofitable for the first four months until I started kind of doing things out of my comfort zone, which was scalping, uh, like market making and, uh, and whatnot, like really studying microstructure uh, Krishna was on the podcast before, um, and he kind of went in, in more in depth about that. So this is the type of trading that we did for a few years until, uh, the edge sort of faded away. It's still there once in a while. It's still there. There's still a couple of setups here and there, a couple of good trades, but, uh, for the most part, yeah. Um, I was unprofitable for about, about four months and, uh, yeah, and uh, my cats and, you know, sur being surrounded by all these profitable traders, you know, you're going to learn from somebody, you yeah. know. So being in that environment is extremely helpful. Did you ever feel like being in that environment can sometimes, and maybe maybe not the beginning because you were learning, so you wanted to just kind of absorb, absorb. But after you kind of got, you know, your footing, was it sometimes tempted to be jaded by someone else's opinion? Oh, that's a good question. So, yes, uh, but that's where you have to, that's where the experience comes in. You know, like I sometimes talk to a couple of traders and we can be in the same stock and the guy's long and I'm short, you know, and I know the guy is an animal. He's a really good trader and he's long a lot. 
and I'm short a lot too. And I'm like, one of us is going to make money. <laughs> <laughs> like, I hope it's me, of course. And, but it's, it really clouds my judgment a little bit, but I'm like, listen, I'm in, in this trade for a reason. Okay. I have to, I have to just go through with it, you know? And, um, and that's it. You have your stop, you have your risk, you have, you know, there's a reason why you're in a trade and, and that's it. You got to just, just follow through with the trade. Yeah, no, that's perfect sense. And I agree with you. Now I'm curious, like after, you know, during those four months, you said it took you about four months to find that consistency. What was it for you? What was your personal challenge that was holding you back the most before you got consistent? Um, just no setups, really. I, I was like, oh, this stock is up a lot. I should short it. Oh, this stock looks like it's going to go up, but there's no structure. You know, like I kind of look at it like if you have like, like an Instagram filter, you know, like you have this like raw picture and then you throw a filter on it and now it looks nice. Right. So like you throw like a few moving averages to have like a reference point and then you have like a higher low and I'm like, okay, I'm buying a higher low risky, you know, as long as it's above a moving average. So there's like this filter where every setup looks the same. Right. And before it was more like, Oh, I think it's going to go up. And like, I guess I, I'll, I'll just buy it. And then it like shakes me out in like five minutes and in a five minute candle, it shakes me out and then it goes without me or like I'll be long and I have no idea where to sell. You know, there was just like this like blur, right? So yeah. you have to get rid of that blur and like just kind of create like, it doesn't even matter what indicate, like I, I like to use VWAP. I like to use moving averages and just reference point like yesterday's high, yesterday's low, today's open, today's, uh, yesterday's close, uh, today's high, low, like reference point where I can just glance at it. I can look at a daily chart, five minute chart, one minute chart, and I know exactly where the stock is. Like in reference to like all other stocks of the same, in the same sector. And I'm like, okay, this one's stronger, this one's weaker. And I can kind of make a plan from there. So whenever you have a blur, when you're like, oh, this stock should go down, let me short it. And you're just kind of like, there's no real entry. There's no real target. It's tough to be consistent that way. So what was that for you in terms of strategies? What was that first strategy that clicked for you? Because I'm sure they'd show you a lot of things. You saw different traders. What was more of your vibe, if you will? So my, my thing was SSR. And I, I've talked about this setup uh, before. But uh, my thing was SSR when like stocks are kind of like uh, highly volatile and they have that SSR on and the offer comes in, right? When the big offer comes in, like sometimes the stock is going to keep dropping without even flipping up one penny. It's gonna, mm -hmm. just going to keep dropping nonstop for, I don't know, maybe it's going to drop 20 cents. Maybe it'll drop a point. but so I would find these spots where I can get in because uh, I was, we, we have like pretty decent routes. So I was able to get in at the midpoint or on the offer sometimes. So it's like you're risking very little. And sometimes, you know, you can just like kind of trail the stop and uh, risk, I don't know, maybe two, three cents or sometimes even like half a penny and make like 30 cents or something like that. So like the risk reward in that trade is pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, that setup. Like I said in the beginning of the show, that's one of those setups where it doesn't really work as well anymore because algos got a little bit smarter. But that was the first setup where, you know, I started making money. And so now since you were saying kind of things were changing for you, was that hard for you to kind of recognize and adapt? How, what was that like for you? Especially so, when you first found, you know, your bearing, you first got consistency and then now you got to adapt, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I just noticed that I think it was actually like three years ago, June, three years ago. By the way, the, the shittiest things happened to me in June. Like I take the worst losses in June, like my birthday's in June. And like on my birthday, I'm like <laughs> celebrating and I'm like, wait a second, something is going to happen. And it always happens. So in June, I was like, I think it was three years ago. Um, the month before that, it was my best month ever. And then in June, I cannot make a single dollar. And I'm like, oh my God, June, here we go. So I just kind of 
um, went uh, from trading SSRs and scalping to, I was like, I have unfinished business with small caps. That's how I started trading and I want to go back to it because I got to figure this out. Because I, I know people are making money. I know there's money to be made. Um, I scalp them. I used to scalp them here and there a little bit. I traded uh, dry ships, made money in, in those shippers when they were running. And I was like, I got to just like figure this out, how to trade them every day because there's always something moving. And so, yeah, I, I just, uh, I recognized right away, pretty much right away. Like within two weeks, I was like, it's this setup is done. Like it's been great for years and it's done now. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of like good traders kind of fell off. Uh, they just never adapted. And uh, yeah, I don't even know what they're doing now. Uh, but a lot of new traders came in, but like definitely learning how to adapt uh, to a different market environment, different setups is it's not easy, but if you already have the psychology, you already have the risk reward, you already understand you're okay with putting the risk on, um, then it, it's much easier to adapt for sure. So are you saying more so of that the, the principles of trading, if, if you're a trader, right, and you have the principles down, the adaptation is just as simple as recognizing a, something's changed and then picking up something new and starting maybe smaller because you're, you know, you understand risk. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, I guess I, I, you know, I'm not a business owner, but I, I feel like it's kind of like owning a business. You're like, oh, okay, this one took off, whatever, or this one's shutting down or whatever. I'm just going to open up this other one. Like I already understand where to get the money, how to put it to work, how to hire people, you know, all that. So it kind of like, it's similar to trading where it's like, okay, this setup uh, isn't really there anymore. So let me just apply those same principles to a different setup and uh, experiment with different stuff, different entries, different exits, different models, maybe run some regressions or some Excel. Different people do it a different way. I like to do some Excel uh, stuff, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Is, yeah. is there... One thing that you're currently, because as traders, we're always growing. Like you said, there's always adaptation. The market's always changing. So for yourself as a trader, is there something that is a challenge for you currently that you're working on to become better? Yeah. So one of the things is holding, um, like today, I actually, I had a really good day, one of my best days, but I am so pissed off because had I just held for another 15, 20 minutes, I like I was short the entire oil, oil sector. And had I held for the extra like 30 minutes, I would have probably doubled my entire day. So like knowing which ones, and, and I was already holding, like I was, I already held for the move. The move happened. I, I scaled out and then there was a second wave and then there was a third wave. And I'm like, oh my God, I left so much money on the table. And so that's one thing that, you know, I know when to hit it hard, but I also need to figure out how can I really maximize the, you know, kind of set the targets, I guess, and just really hold for the second and third wave. So that's what I'm working on. I'm, I'm going to, this weekend, I'm going to spend some time just going back and uh, seeing, you know, really why I got out um, and how can I, uh, avoid that next time, you know, getting out too soon, whether it's, uh, you know, either trailing, um, or setting better targets. So that's, that's what I was going to ask next. Like, do you already, I'm sure you already have a feel. I'm sure you've been looking at all your trades after they happen and be like, okay, how could I hold this longer? So do you think that your gut reaction right now is like more of a trailing stop or something like that? So I'm more of a, cover like if i'm short cover into like a big wash and then short the bounce hmm. and usually when i short the bounce uh, a lot of times i'll go in too soon too heavy and now i'm like i kind of have like a crappy average which is okay but like on this one i was really waiting for the bounce and the bounce never came so it just kind of consolidated a little bit and i'm like i don't know if i should reshort this tiny consolidation because it'll probably give me a better entry and it just it just you know, went again. Um, so it was like really weak today. 
Um, yeah. How do you deal with those? Cause it's going to, it happens often. I'm sure like it's just as a trader, a lot of people don't realize that you're not going to hit everything. You're not going to take those big wins all the time. There's going to be a lot of times where you get upset even when you have a big day, like, you know, today you had a great yeah. day. So how, how do you handle this moving forward and pushing through that and not letting it affect you the next day? Um, oh man, you know, it's better than taking a loss, I guess, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, you left money, like left money on the table. You'll never really short top and cover bottom consistently. You know, it'll happen once in a while, but it's okay if you catch the meat of the move. Uh, but like, I'm not like too much of a perfectionist, but I just want to get a little bit better. You know what I mean? So like, I'm okay. Um, I'm okay with good enough as you know, cause like, if I'm trying to force a perfect trade, like I'll take a few big losses, you know? So I'm okay with like a good solid trade. Um, but I'm still going to try and just improve it a little bit. So now that makes sense. It, Cause I mean, I, I can relate to you on trying to make the perfect trade. Cause then you usually take more losses because yeah. you just want that best execution, the top and the bottom it is, you know, I, I'm curious on just your perspective. Have you felt that, the current market right now and in terms of how you trade, has it really affected how you personally trade prior, let's say the month before this whole coronavirus thing broke out and coronavirus was kind of like changing quote unquote, changing the market. Have you seen a difference for you and how you trade because of all this? No, not at all. Just liquidity, just bigger. Yeah. So actually 2020 started very good for me. Like since like January 1st, like I was on a pretty hot streak, knock on wood. Um, but yes, <laughs> yeah, um, it's the same setups. Well, I'm not doing anything differently. I, I'm just pushing size. That's all. I'm glad you said that because I mean, it's, it's interesting. You, you see some people think things go away when, when the market starts panicking and, and I've kind of been in the same boat as you, if anything, just volatility and volume has been increased, but the patterns or at least the strategies are kind of pretty much the same. Yeah. I don't think that w when you're trading momentum, I don't think patterns really go away. You know, they might like, maybe if the market is weak, there's more, um, there's more shorting opportunities, right? When the market is strong, there's more buying opportunities. So like certain, certain setups may work better in certain market conditions, but it's not like the setup is going to go away. So like the, some setups go away. Like what I was referring to before was, it was purely like a microstructure trade where mm -hmm. like algos are kind of in control of the stock and I'm at their mercy, you know? So those type of things do go away. Um, but momentum trading, it's kind of all the same. It's just like, are we buying it? Are we shorting it? You know, that type of thing. I understand. And so going back to what you said earlier in January, you kind of start the, started off the year pretty hot. What do you feel like that, what is contributing to that? Like, is there something you were working on last year that's finally clicking for you? Can you give me some insight? Yeah, so, um, so I basically created a system, okay? A very interesting system that, forces me to size up when I'm doing well and to size down when I'm not doing well. And, uh, and it's gotten to the point where it's like, I'm, I'm doing okay. And so I have to trade bigger and the bigger I trade, the more it's like, Oh my God, I really don't want to lose the, that R. Right. Um, so I better find a good setup. Like I don't want to short a stock that's up a little bit. I want to short a stock that has a lot of meat on the bone. So I'm finding the juiciest one and I'm hitting it with that R, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it pays off and I'm like, okay, I got to size up even more, you know? So I'm like, okay, what's like the most volatile, the most liquid stock that I can find. And I have to get in at the, at a really good entry. It doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be a good trade. So that mentality of like, I don't want to do anything stupid. Yeah. I'm not trying to make money for the sake of making money. I want to put on the best trades I can today. And, do you uh, feel like that, that mindset, are you trading less this year than like normal? I'm trading probably uh, less hours, like fewer hours mm -hmm. of the day uh, because the, 
most volatile time is is right at the open and right at the close. Yep. So I'm like, okay, if I'm risking one R, like it's probably gonna pay off the most right at right at the open or right at the close. So that those are the two two kind of time frames where I'm trading uh, the most. Um, this still watching. I'm still watching the market during the day, like what's setting up. And occasionally I'm going to hit something, you know, uh, midday, but I find myself like getting squeezed or cause it's like the volume kind of dry, you know, dries down and, and, uh, it gets more difficult to trade during, you know, midday. But yeah, other, no, than that, I'm, yeah, other than that, I'm, yeah, other than that, I'm probably putting on same number of trades, uh, just more at the open, more at the close. Can you share a little bit about what you mean by this new strategy, not strategy, that's the wrong word, but this new system to, you know, increase while you're doing well. And then, and I'm assuming it's the opposite too, when you're not doing well, yeah. because as a trader for me, one thing that I've implemented, you know, really intrigued me that you said that is I've implemented that same thing, but for losing, like if I lose on so my first trade, I downsize a little bit more and downside. And then when I get back, you know, when I may not up, up it back up, but I don't go over the normal one R that I'm used to. So yeah, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that. So the kind of foundation for the, for the idea is we have to trade bigger when we're doing well and we have to trade smaller when we're not doing well. So assuming that, you know, I'm a trend follower, technically speaking, we're momentum traders, we're trend followers, right? Even if you're not like, you know, um, whatever, if you're a momentum trader, technically speaking, you're a trend follower. So if I'm a trend, my trading is a trend, my PNL curve is a trend, then I can apply some moving averages to it and see what kind of numbers I have. So I'm tracking, um, I'm tracking a lot of stuff um, with my PNL. Um, the most important metric is average green day. And so basically, I'm thinking, what's the most that I should lose on a bad day, probably one average green day, right? Cause yep. right. It makes sense. Right. 100%, yep. If you're losing two green days or three green days, it's like, okay, my, my week is kind of messed up. I'm not in the right mindset, you know, but if it's one average green day, then you're like, I don't give a shit, man. I'll fucking make it back tomorrow. Uh, by the way, I'm not, I'm not sure if we can uh, swear. No, you're fine. Podcast, you're fine. This but, is, if you, yeah, uh, you're fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I'm like, okay, so I'm, tra I'm trailing, um, excuse me, I am uh, tracking uh, 22 day moving average of my average green day, aside from all the other metrics, that's the most important one. And I'm setting my daily lockout, which is daily max loss mm -hmm. to that number, right? So let's say it's a uh, hundred, let's say it's a thousand dollars, right? Okay. And so I'm like, okay, I got a thousand dollars to risk for the day. I'm going to say, I'm going to risk a third of that on a trade. I'm gonna, I can take three trades and be wrong and that's going to be my day. What are the chances I'll take three trades and be wrong? Probably, I'm probably not going to get locked out. Yeah. Um, and that's it. And then the better I trade, you know, the moving average goes up. It goes from 1,000 to 1,200, 1,500, 2,000. Next thing you know is a 10,000. Next thing you know is a 20, you know, like it yeah. goes up and now you're like, oh my God, I'm, my one R is like, <laughs> now it's at 3,000 bucks. And like, you know how they say, like, you should earn your lock. You should earn your, you should earn your lock. You should earn uh, the right to size up. Yes. But it's so subjective. It's mm -hmm. like, did I earn it? Like, okay, I traded well for two, three days. Like, did I earn it? Did I not earn it? Like, if you put it in a formula like that, you know, track your average green day and set that to your daily lockout. Set your R to a third of that. And that's how you earn it, like for me. So that's how I, I earn the right to size up. Nice. Could you give me, I, I don't want to dive into this because it'll just take up too much time, but you said there's other criteria. Can you just say a couple, Just, but I don't want to dive into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, average, obviously, uh, average green day, average red day. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I don't use average green day as my lockout anymore. I use average median day uh, because average green day Average mean, uh, median day excludes outliers. So if I have like a really big trade 
I don't want it to affect um, anything. I understand. And so, yeah, average red day, um, um, what's it called? Uh, win rate, as in how many green days out of total. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, tracking my drawdown, how many days I'm spending in a drawdown. So out of 22 days, percent-wise, like, what's my drawdown, like, how much time I'm spending in a drawdown. So I have a goal, like, I don't want to spend too much time in a drawdown in a month. Um, you know, that kind of, those kind of things, a few other ones, but these ones are kind of, uh, the main ones. Okay. Yeah. You know, you know, um, appreciate you sharing that. Cause that's gets me thinking and I could think later about that. So I'm curious on, since you mentioned drawdown, a lot of traders who are listening to this show may, uh, most of them are working on their trading, right? They're not consistent yet. They're, they're trying to grow drawdowns can be very tough, especially when, you, when you're going through that. I don't know about you, but I'm very curious uh, of how you handle it because I can just to give you a little insight of me. I don't, I don't upload anything to the end of the month, end of the week. So I don't really know, quote unquote, no, you know, specifically if I'm going to draw down. We know, but like, yeah. that's what helps me. Like, I don't really see it on paper until it's over. <clears throat> how do you handle it? Well, when I'm down... When I'm starting to lose money, a lot of money relative to like what my average green day is, uh, I start downsizing. And so like, I, you know, how do you, how do you get out of a hole? Like you have to stop digging the hole first. Right. And so first I size down like way down until I start kind of going back um, to trading in the zone. And, uh, but it mentally it can be devastating. Honestly, like, I think it was in June, last June. Um, Dude, I better not hear you in June this June. This I yeah, am. <laughs> it might have been in June. I don't, I don't remember. There was like two months where I just could. I mean, I wasn't really in a bad drawdown because I was trading so tiny at that point. But I was like, I don't know, man. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. And so I spoke to my cat. Um, <clears throat> you know, he's like, call me. I called him and um, he was like, dude, you're like, you're good. Like, you're fine. Just try to make like 500 bucks today, you yeah. know, just, just try to make 500 bucks, you know, see what happens from there. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'll, I'll just do that. And, uh, you know, just starting kind of restarting from zero. I'm just like, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I guess I'll just put on three scalps with a thousand shares and see if I can do it, you know? Um, but yeah, it can, it can definitely be devastating, but it's really good to have somebody, you know, like, I have my cats. I have some other guys. Um, but it's good to have somebody next to you that knows you, knows mm -hmm. you as a trader, and can kind of uplift you uh, when you need to be, you know? So well, I, I have one or two more questions before we wrap this up. I, I want to know, looking back at those times, what was it that got you? What what was making that happen? Like, was it a habit? Was it an old habit? Was it a new habit that came in? Was it just FOMO? What was it that got you in the drawdown state? Yeah, it was that blur probably where it's, it's a combination of things, but it's mainly just um, having like not trading in the zone and just doing reckless things, not following the system, not following anything that I've put on a piece of paper, like abandoning my daily routine, not journaling, it, all these things they add, you know, and, and now I'm chasing stocks and I'm not setting good targets and I'm canceling stops, you know, thinking, oh, it's just going to wick me out and come back. And next thing I know, I cancel my stop and now I'm out of money, like nine hours, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like pre-market. I'm double locked out pre-market. It's like horrible. <laughs> so yeah. like a lot of these things, they like snap you out of, out of the, out of the zone. And it's very important to be, you know, to, to, to be in the zone, to, to, to have the daily routine to do the same thing every day, you know, check the news every day, whatever it is that you're doing in the morning to kind of get you in the zone so that, you know, you don't want to cancel stops. You don't want to change plans. You don't want to cancel targets. Just kind of do the same thing every day and don't, you know, turn too, too far away from that. 
Yeah, no, and I appreciate you saying that because it, it sheds light that you no, know, a lot of people have the misconception that as a trader, people like yourself, people who do this for a living, they think that it's all sunshine and roses, right? And they think it's just constantly wins. And what, and they think when I get to stands level, I won't have to deal with these losses. Where the reality is, you deal yeah. with them still. I deal with yeah. them. Everyone deals with them. And you're always going to deal with them. And if anything, you're going to deal with them at a much bigger level, the better you get. So it's, uh, you just got to learn how to, how to constantly recognize it. I'm, I appreciate you sharing that. And, and so there's one thing that you mentioned, and I, and I feel like I'm about to have a brain fart on it. And it was, you know, and so what I'll, what I'll do is this. If you can tell us, if anyone ever has any questions, and if I have a question, I'll come back to you because I, I know that I just forgot it. But if, if anyone can reach out to you, what's the best way for them to ask you questions or best way to find, find you? Oh, definitely on Twitter. Uh, if you go to Chocana Trader, C-I-O-C-A-N-A Trader. Um, I'm very active. I'm very bored too right now being quarantined. It's uh, uh, April 24th. 2020 we're very bored over here so answering all the questions <laughs> really quickly <laughs> so oh yeah. i understand that and by the way what does your shirt mean 50k short man yeah tell go ahead yeah. tell me tell me about it oh it was just <clears throat> it, it's just a brand that i uh i think it's badass you know yeah and that's it oh okay all right all right i didn't know yeah. if it meant something specific no, no, it was just, uh, so it, it just sounds cool. And I was like, why not like do something for the community, you know, like launch these shirts. And so I'm like, but I don't like, I don't want to be like that sleazy, sleazy salesman, like trying to, you know, like profit off of a couple of guys, you know, yeah. two shirts. So I was like, whatever, all the profit goes to charity. So we donated a little money to, um, an animal shelter. And a lot of people are wearing these shirts like all over the United States and uh, in Canada. And that was a really cool project that I, uh, I shut it down. It was, it was great while it lasted. And uh, shirts are pretty soft and uh, people are wearing them. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome, man. Well, look, Sam, I really appreciate you being here today, sharing some time with me. And again, let's stay in context. You never know where life will take us. For sure. Thanks a lot, Alex. It's my pleasure to be on your show.